reflection of our scripture portion. I love God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. I love Jesus Christ with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. And I love the Holy Spirit with all my heart, soul, and mind. I'm just thankful for what God has done and how he saved us. This morning we find ourselves in the book of Titus and we're in chapter 3. I had a neat little uh, preaching formula that I was going to go through that I would finish Titus just before Christmas and then I would go into a couple Christmas messages and then beginning the first year I would take a, a story of the Bible and begin from Genesis to Revelation and the theme would be the, the line, the story line would be the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, Daniel said, the greatness of the kingdom. And I think that's been lost in evangelical churches today. I think people have lost sight of what God intended to do as far back as Genesis chapter 2 and what he is going to do in Revelation 22. And there's a story there that has gotten lost ever since the church has been founded. And it's a, just almost a little trickle that keeps going back and forth. And what is God intending to do in the world? That'll be delayed a couple weeks in, fe in January because... I looked at the passage ahead in verses 4 and 5 of Titus, and I just could not blow through it. It just, it just will not let me blow through it. When we look at chapter 3 of Titus, Titus is ministering to a real difficult culture, much like ours, very difficult. And it's not getting any better, quite frankly. And the tendency is that we as believers have a responsibility to this culture. It's to represent Jesus Christ. We are the ambassadors. In chapter 2, Paul told us, here's how we act within the church. Here are the instructions in the church. Now when we get to chapter 3, he tells us, here's the instructions in how you and I as believers are to live in the world. And he starts out, as you just take a look, we'll just read a couple of verses till we get to chapter 3, verse 4 in Titus. And we read this in this book. Remind them, he says, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. And here's the reason. For we were once foolish, ourselves disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lifetime in malice and every hateful hating one another. You say, ah, it wasn't me. Ah, but prior to your salvation, it was you. It may have been covered up with religiosity. It may be covered up with manners. It may be covered up with this, that, or the other thing. But I'm telling you, prior to your salvation and my salvation, this characterized all of us mentally and physically. It wasn't until we were born again, until then, that God made the changes in our heart and life. And we became unselfish. And we are now in a world that is characterized by all these things. Look what he says, be peaceable. Be loving to the neighbors. Be kind, be gentle. Look at verse 4. And when the kindness of our God, our Savior... And his love for mankind appeared. That's at our salvation. Kindness. God was kind toward us. 
In light of what we were in our unsaved state, God was awful kind to us. As he was to Adam when Adam sinned. He said to Adam, the day you sin, you shall what? Surely die. And he was kind enough to let him live long enough to have children. That's because, and then we're the result of God's kindness. We're the result of God's kindness. He was very kind. How does God show kindness to us? Almost taken like out of Malachi. How does God show kindness to us? He shows kindness to us in that he saved us. He didn't have to save us. I remember flying over the jungles of Brazil, the Amazon jungle, and every now and then I was in a 737 jet, and I'd look down and I'd see a wisp of smoke coming out of a, the jungle somewhere, and I thought, who in the world are these people? And why am I living in the United States of America and why was I not born in a jungle? Who made that, who made that decision? I didn't. My mom and dad didn't make that decision. That decision was made by a sovereign God who is full of kindness. It was a drawing of God by the Holy Spirit who called us to the truth. That truth stirred our hearts to hear his word so that we could believe and be saved from our sin. You know what the Bible says about us? There is none, no, not one, who seeks God. None. None. And if it weren't for the fine kindness of God, none of us would be here this morning. We would have never come to Christ. I know when you listen to the news, when you're propagandized by ungodly culture, the media, the educators, the entertainers, the books, the magazines, videos, politicians, friends, neighbors, they don't see God as kind. The minute you mention God, the first thing they bring up is how could a God of love have starving people in the Sudan? You ever heard that? Why? Because they never see the kindness of God. Yet here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and the tolerance and patience not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. People don't see that. Why? Because they're sinners at nature, sinners at heart. The sinful nature of man causes him to treat God as his enemy. Remember what it says in Romans? While we were yet what? Enemies. You may have been grown, grown up in a Christian home as I. I don't recall ever a time when I was growing up that it was a discussion of whether we're going to church on Saturday tomorrow. I never grew up in a home like that. If it was Sunday, we automatically went. I didn't always want to go, but we automatically went. And we had a half-mile driveway and a half-mile dirt road when I was a kid. And we'd have either the car in the ditch or the pickup in the ditch. Uh, that was the way it was. Then we didn't go. But we were there when the doors were open. And yet I had a heart full of rebellion. Oh, I sat in Sunday school. I was forced to memorize a Sunday school verse on the way to church. We lived 15 miles away in a gravel road, so... Well, I had time to learn it. Supposed to learn it before, but I never did. I didn't have a heart toward God. Who was I kidding? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 11, there's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. They don't see God in his kindness. 
And if you're here this morning and you think God is not kind, you got a major problem. He is kind. And he saved us, quite frankly, in spite of who and what we are, right? Would you admit that? He saved us in spite of who and what we are. Nonetheless, God is still kind in two prominent ways. The first one is God is impartial in his goodness. And secondly, God is patient. Luke chapter 6. I hate to put all these verses on the board, but by the time I, we get everybody finding it, many times we'd go here till 2.30, and I don't think you want to go that far. So I put them up here. Luke 6.35 says this, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So what are we supposed to do? Be kind to ungrateful men. Be kind to our enemies. Now, you may think you're so nice you don't have enemies, but we all have enemies. We all have people in our lives that make the hair in the back of our neck stand up when we meet them. We all have people in our eyes, lives that we would rather avoid. Is that true? Probably. And we are supposed to be what toward them? Kind. Even if they're ungrateful. So, God is impartial. He's kind to all. You heard the saying, I mean, it rains on the what? The just and the unjust. That's his kindness. The other one is, is God is patient. Listen to this. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but that all come to repentance. Are you not happy that God waited long enough now for you to be saved? Aren't you glad that he didn't shut you off the first time you denied him and listen, the time you heard salvation? Aren't you glad? He patiently waited for you and me to come to Christ. Should we not be patient toward a world that's living around us who doesn't know the Lord? That's why we're not to malign them. That's why he says, I, I don't want you to malign them. I want you to be peaceable. I want you to be enjoyable because I want you to win these people for Christ. That's our goal. Since man is created in the image of God, he has a sense of morality. So all men is, are able to know right from wrong. You know, we have a little dog. We have two dogs. One's about ready to go. The other one just came into the world. And you know, they act like dogs. We're surprised. Don't take that food from that dog. Don't pester that dog. And I have to remind the women folk in our house, they're dogs. <laughs> That's the way the unbeliever acts. As I said last couple Sundays, we should not be shocked when we see unbelievers act like unbelievers. We're not for immorality, and we're not for homosexuality, and we're not for transgenderism. But by the same token, you and I have a responsibility to be kind to them. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to accept their manner of life. But we need to be kind and be careful what we say. 
Because we are representing Jesus Christ. God is kind toward him. He didn't strike him down dead. The other reason is the love of God for man in the next part of this verse. For when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. The English translation of his love is the word philanthropia, from which we get philanthropy, kindness, people do things for those kinds of things. It's one word, actually. The, the word Philadelphia is love plus, plus Adelphos, Philadelphia, love for man. God loves men. So what's our responsibility? To love men. To love unbelievers. Believers especially. Note one quick definition of the overarching God's attribute of love. The founder of our seminary that I went to, Alva J. McLean, said this. Love is that in God which moves him to give himself and his gifts spontaneously, voluntarily, righteously, and eternally for the need of personal beings, regardless of their merit or response. That's what God's love is. I mean, you could get even more elaborate in the, in the definition of God's love. But it is a voluntary, spontaneous love regardless of their, their response. God's love is unselfish. It is that in God. God does not love us for what he can get out of us. Have you ever heard this among Christians or people? Well, I, I invited them to our house, and they've never invited us back, so we're never going to have them over again till they invite us. That's legalism. You're loving for what you can get back, right? That's not God's love. God loves you and me for what we are. Take a look at Deuteronomy. That's the fifth book of the Bible. It's where your pages still stick together. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 7, and look at verse 7 and 8. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8. You know, in these kinds of sermons, I wish I had a soft, tender little voice that I'm trying to be kind and gracious and coming across that way. But God gave me the voice I got, and I have to really work on it. But I love you guys, and I love the church, and I love doing what I'm doing, and I love God, and I love God's people. And I love his world, and I wish people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. Speaking to Israel, the Lord did not set his love on you, or choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you. You know why I loved Israel? They weren't the greatest. In fact, when you look at their history, they may have been the most stubborn people in the world. He loved them because he loved them. You know why God loves you and me? Because we're perfect, the little angels. He loves us because he loves us. I love my wife because I love her. I don't have to have a lot of reasons. Romans 5 8. God demonstrates his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Think of that. 
How much more love could God show to mankind and to us as Christians in that his only begotten, unique son died in our place to save us from an eternal hell? God's love is eternal. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. If there are gifts of prophecies, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. At the coming of Christ, all of this will be done away. What's really unique is the word tongues in there uses a word that is not used with the other two, prophecy and with knowledge. It's the word cease. When Jesus said, when he stood on the boat and the waves and wind were blowing, what did he say? Peace, be still. And what happened? Stop. Stop. God's love for mankind is manifested in the giving of his son. You all know this verse. And you should know it. It used to be every time you saw it football game or a baseball game, a guy behind the backstop dressed in kind of ridiculous clothing had a sign, John 3, 16. What does it say? For God so loved the And how did he show it? He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, we read this a couple weeks ago in the morning service. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be propitiation, satisfaction of his wrath for our sins. Wow. Well, let's go on to the next verse. It gets deeper still. He saved us. That's an aorist tense, which means a point of time. We were saved in the past. Being saved, what does that mean, being saved? When you say you're saved, or when you say he saved us, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it meant to me that when I got saved, I'm no longer going to hell. It meant my sins are forgiven. All the rotten stuff I did, and I wasn't some considered by anybody a gross sinner. My teachers in high school thought so, but I really wasn't. I spent my time in the principal's office and, and uh, in the dean of men and college. But you know what? I'm clean from all that. I'm forgiven for all that. And unfortunately, I've sinned since I've saved Last year it was on Thursday. <laughs> Seriously. It's more often than that. Every day. Every day. And every day, when we confess our sins, he's faithful. He's just. He's faithful, that means he'll do the same thing every time. He's just because the sins were paid for. He's righteous in forgiving us. And you know what else he does as a bonus? He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what you need to remember in communion this morning. He saved us. Not only that, what it means in that, he cleansed us. He made us one with Christ. You know, Christ, where is Christ this morning? He is seated at the right hand of God personally. Well, he's everywhere present at the same time. Try to get that one under your control. He's there. 
And you know where I am? Where you are if you're saved? You're with him. He represents you at the Father's right hand. And what does that mean? He's making intercession for you. You want to know who's praying for you 24-7? It's the Lord Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. That's what it means when he saved you. Furthermore, it wasn't on the basis of deeds which we have done. You're not saved because you're born a Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, Mennonite, or whatever. That didn't save you. Didn't save me. You're not saved by the right or the religious exercise of baptism, be it infant or adult, three times forward, sprinkled, poured, or dipped. The Bible has the right method, and the Bible talks about believers being baptized. You're not baptized to be saved. You're baptized to show you are saved as a confession of sin. Here's a little note free. Our children ask us, uh, when can we take communion? You ever had that, parents? Here's uh, our, our, our answer. Take it or leave it. Our answer was, you don't take communion until you've given a public profession of your faith in Christ via baptism. You know what that does? Every time you have a communion service, you have the opportunity, of parents, to say, you know why you couldn't take communion? You haven't made a public profession of faith. That's your first step as a believer, right? And if you've been baptized, you've been saved after you've been baptized, you haven't been baptized. So it's not on religious rights or good deeds that we have done. You can do all the deeds that so-called Mother Teresa did and you can still go to hell. Right? Mary wasn't saved because she's the mother of Jesus. She was saved because she put her faith and trust in Jesus. You're not saved because of our deeds. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You know that by memory, probably, in this church at least. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You get to heaven, you're not going to come to me. You know why I got to heaven? I memorized the Bible, every word from from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. And I'm going to say, bully for you. I didn't. You know why I got here? Because Jesus Christ paid it all. There's nothing more to pay. He said on the cross, it is finished. Nothing else to do but believe him and trust him. You know, the best we can crank up in our, our lives, Isaiah 64, 6, for all of us, no exceptions, have become like one who's unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a tear, like a leaf and all our iniquities like the wind take us away. Every good deed I've done prior to my salvation is nothing more in the sight of God than a rag to be discarded. Doesn't help at all. I, like you, have sat at funerals and they prayed at all the good works. Surely one stuck and he made it and they waited out over here. And it was good enough as they weighed his evil deeds. Ever heard that kind of thing? I have. Well, put it on a scale. Put it like this. On a scale. Here you have the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And over here, you have your works. How does that measure up? The Bible says, for all have sinned, and what? Come short of the glory of God. Bing, you know, can't, can't overdo it. In John 19, 30, Jesus said, it's finished. There's nothing else to do but you to believe. That's all you do. Now, belief is more than a nod to God, obviously. Belief is trust. Belief is a commitment. It's according to his mercy. Mercy is that deep compassion of God that moves him and motivates him to be kind and good to those in pitiful and miserable conditions, even though they don't earn it. Are you miserable here this morning? I had a guy tell me that he was in our church and he felt like he was the loneliest guy in the world. What a miserable condition. God has mercy for you. He has mercy. He doesn't want that, whether you've earned it or not. Look at Ephesians 2, 4, and 6. We've looked at 2, 8, and 9, but look at this. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, he has pity on the merciless. He has pity on these people. What do you think when you watch the news and you look at Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and you see rows of people living in squalor, in tents, cardboard boxes. What do you say? You ought to get a bulldozer and bulldoze them out of there? What does God think of them? He has mercy. You know what they need? They don't need rehabilitation. They need a savior. They need a savior. How many times I, I've seen some of the pitiful wrecks of humanity and I've thought to myself, man, how bad is this? And I forget about the fact that they're lost. How else would I expect them to live? They're miserable people, so instead of turning to Christ, what do they turn to? Some false religion. They turn to entertainment, to sports, to drown out that misery. Or they turn chemically to something to numb their soul. You want to talk about a drug society, we're in it. Numb the heart. Numb the soul. Don't you have to think about it and go to God and deal with it. Well, here's how he does it. His mercy. God's attitude toward, is to pity the miserable, those in distress. Therefore, mercy operates in the practical realm. You want to know the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is God's favor toward the guilty, the lawbreaker. So it operates in a judicial form. Mercy, on the other hand, is God's attitude of pity toward the miserable. So it operates in the practical realm. The channel through which salvation is applied to us is twofold, and he gives it to us in this verse. First of all, by the washing of regeneration, and secondly, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration 
is really, uh, the word regeneration is the word born again. You're washed clean when you're born again. The washing does not refer to water. The washing refers to the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. And how does the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse us from all sin? The blood speaks of the judgment that your sins and mine deserved. I violated it. I, I, as a finite human being, have spit in the face of the Almighty God. How do I make that right? I can't. I deserve all the wrath and judgment that I deserves by me spitting in his face. So what did he do? He sent his son to pay my judgment and forgive me of spitting in his face. And he cleansed me. He cleansed it. He just took his death and he raced it off the board. Not guilty. I was cleansed. It's used that way in Ephesians 5.26, so that he might sanctify her, speaking of his bride, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. With the word. How does the word cleanse me? Oh, I read Titus 3. I'm not doing what he said. And I can go two ways. I can say, well... It really doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't really mean that. Or I can say it means it, and I'm a sinner. That's what it says. And then I cleanse myself. I go to him and I say, Lord, I'm sorry. I made a foolish error. I said, your word really doesn't mean what it says. Doesn't really mean what it says. I'll be the interpreter of your word. No, your word is true. I'm wrong. Malachi went all through that as we heard this morning. Earlier. So we are washed. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. You need to see this list and be reminded of this list. 1 Corinthians 9, and uh, let me take a look at it. Um, why am I not seeing it now? I have it here. 9, verse 11 says such were 6. I meant 6. 1 Corinthians 6, that's the reason. Take a look at verse 9. Do you not know that unrighteousness will, inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, that list excluded me. That's kind of what Paul thought. Remember that? And then he said, I read, thou shalt not covet. That sunk the ship. Because we've all coveted. We're just as bad as the homosexuals, the effeminate. We're as bad as the altars. We're as bad as the fornicators. And if we haven't done it, we thought it. I like, the, I like verse 11, don't you? Such were some of you, but you are what? Washed. 
You're cleansed. You're sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Whew. I'd like to go on to regeneration. I'll save it for next week. Regeneration is the first step from death to life. Regeneration is born again. Jesus said, you were, or Paul said, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, right? We were dead to God. I used to have a classic story. I have to keep telling face that I've got to come up with another one. But uh, I can't think of a better one. First funeral I had was in Iowa, middle of Iowa, on a hot, sultry day. And I was in a little tiny church, 35 to 50 people. And we had a little foyer, and they put the, the custom was to put the coffin there with the body of the deceased in the coffin. My first funeral. And I was supposed to stand there like this as people came in, and here's the body. And I took a glance over there, and there was a fly inside the, inside the screen. And it was crawling on the deceased's face. And I thought, surely there'll be a... <laughs> or a... You know what? None of that. Why? Dead! We are for salvation. We're dead to Christ. Right? We don't have any response to it. Oh, we may have a modicum of some man's religion about Christ, but we don't have the biblical, godly teaching. So what's the first step to make us alive? That's regeneration. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. May it make an impact on our lives this morning as we practice communion. May we practice this in a right way and by being led by the Spirit of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.